to Let's Talk Careers, a talk show for students, hosted by students. And uh, we are your student hosts. Hi, I'm Taylor, a senior at Wheaton High School and Thomas Edison. And I'm Marcelo, a senior at Northwest High School. And I'm Ashley, a junior at Gaithersburg High School. We are delighted to introduce our career guest for today. Leaders from the world of bioscience, welcome to Let's Talk Careers. Please let me introduce you first to Dr. Stephanie Chung. Dr. Stephanie T. Chung is a scientist at the National Institutes of Health, where she conducts research in pediatrics and endocrinology and co-leads the metabolic research program in the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases. She also established a joint NIDDK and Children's National Hospital research program that focuses on helping youth and young adults with type 2 diabetes. Dr. Chung focuses her work on reducing health disparities in diabetes by improving prevention, treatment, and management of the disease, especially in children, teens, and young adults from minority populations. Welcome to our show today. Thank you, Taylor. It's great to be here. Next is Dr. Aubrey Watkins III. Dr. Watkins is currently a director in corporate development and leads scientific and technical assessments for mergers and acquisitions at Emergent Biosolutions in Gaithersburg, Maryland. He supports Emergent's mission of protecting and enhancing life from public health threats and emerging infectious diseases. Dr. Watkins was most recently involved in the company's two largest acquisitions, which expanded the product portfolio to include specialty vaccines for emerging infectious diseases and Narcan, a drug used to rescue patients from opioid overdoses. Welcome. Thank you for the kind introduction, Marcelo, and it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Our next guest is Dr. Katarina Meisel. She is an assistant professor in the Fishall Department of Bioengineering at the University of Maryland College Park where she runs a research lab and teaches bioengineering courses. Her lab's research focuses on finding better ways to modulate and study the immune system using engineering approaches, including tissue engineering and drug delivery. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Thank you all for being here today. This show is coming to you live via YouTube by the way of Zoom. Before we start our interview questions, I want to briefly talk about the importance of Let's Talk Careers. This show is designed to let students learn about different career paths and the journeys of successful men and women like the speakers with us today. Students are submitting questions live via our YouTube chat and have also sent in questions prior to today's show to ask our guests. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. We're so excited to get to learn more about your careers and about bioscience. Let's dive right in. What has your favorite job been and why? We can start this off with Dr. Meisel, move on to Dr. Chung, and then Dr. Watkins. My favorite job has actually been the job that I'm currently in. So being a professor, that was kind of the end goal for me, um, you know, going through all of my training at first. And I've been here for about two years now um, and really loving the experience. I am like Dr. Meisel, I really love what I do. I love taking care of patients. I love being a researcher and asking those really hard questions. And I think I love teaching, just being able to interact with all kinds of learners uh, and, and be there for them and advocate for them. So I, my favorite job, there's actually more than one, but my favorite job too is the one that I currently hold. And the reason why is it really brings together everything and all the jobs that I've done prior to the one that I hold now together all in one. So working in the laboratory, working with people on the business side of the company, clinicians, professions, regulatory people, manufacturing personnel, in the job that I hold now, I get to work with them all. Wow, I love how all of you are kind of on the same page there. Um, so the next question is, did any of you have an internship or work experience that help define your interest or develop your skills in preparation for your career in bioscience? We can start with Dr. Chong, go on to Dr. Watkins, and end with Dr. Meisel. I think around high school, so I was 15 or 16, I volunteered at the hospital, and I was put in the pediatric ward and to help bring the food to the kiddos. And just being in the environment, taking care of kids who were in the hospital because they were malnourished, and seeing the effect that the doctors and the nurses had on these kiddos, 
that's when I decided, yeah, this is what I want to do. During college, I did work in a laboratory. I volunteered to work in a not so clean place. I worked for a guy who was doing work for sewage and waste facilities, but it was a way for me to understand all of the intricacies of working in a laboratory from the ground up. And that got me very excited. And I did an internship with him, which turned into another exciting internship or job while I was still in school that allowed me to look at mitochondrial DNA and get DNA out of the teeth of mummies and from burial sites. So that's how I got my start. I actually got my start also in high school. I participated in a summer camp at a university where we were doing just a little bit of research, getting kind of a glimpse of what it's like to get your hands dirty in a lab. Um, so that's kind of what sparked my interest in research. And then actually as an undergraduate student, I continued and I did several internships in different labs, got to explore different facets of bioengineering research. And that really just fascinated me and, and made me want to continue on. Wow, that was great. You guys all have some off, awesome experiences there. Okay, so now I have a fun little question. Um, what was your favorite subject in high school and why? So I'm going to throw it to Dr. Watkins and then to Dr. Meisel and finally Dr. Chung. Well, if you take it from my dad, my favorite topics weren't in science, but I actually did enjoy chemistry quite a bit. And it was a way for me to really understand life at the ground level. So I really wanted to know how things work. I even thought about how did drugs work? How could you take this pill, then ingest it in your body and it know exactly where to go and what to work on? And so it was then, I didn't know it then at the time exactly, but in retrospect, that's why, where the curiosity started. So to really understand everything that I do today, I have to think back even now to what it was that got me excited back then. And I can just tell you that my first, the first job that I ever had Finally, when I started working in the industry, I called my old chemistry teacher and let her know from the laboratory that I was in, standing right then and there and said, hey, you know, I'm a molecular biologist and I I'm still in touch with her till this day. Yeah, for me, um, my favorite subject was probably math, which I guess makes sense being an engineer after all. Um, but I always had this issue with math of not understanding its application so well. Um, so I actually have two favorite subjects, math and physics, because physics to me felt a lot of times like, oh, this is why I'm learning the math and where, I'm can, where I can actually apply it. So I loved physics, but for the life of me, I was not very good at it. So my favorite ended up being biology because I wanted to see how to make how things would work and pull them apart and see if they would go back together. That is so interesting. And now I want to be able to define what bioscience is. It is such a broad industry, so we can turn this to um, Dr. Meisel. That's a, a very tough one to define. It is a very, very broad industry. So biosciences can really be anything ranging um, from you know, the bioengineering work that I do, biomedical side of things, so working more on the in the medical field, um, all the way to, you know, if you really think about it, agricultural, that's also part of biosciences. It is an incredibly broad field with lots of different areas. If Dr. Watkins or Dr. Chung would like to add on, go ahead. Sure, sure. Uh, Dr. Chung, you want to go or I'll, I'll go next if you, yep, we'll have at it. So uh, the way I look at bioscience really is anything that we do, anything we do as scientists or people who are not even scientists for that matter within the pharmaceutical or biotechnology industry that really brings to bear solutions on making life better, making our health a little bit better as a result of the work we do. So that could be someone who is a computer scientist working on digital therapeutics or AI and working on a wearable or a device. All those things come together to really make life a little bit better and to fix things when people are sick. To me, that's biosciences and it ranges from manufacturing to research to getting a shot in the pharmacy. That's what I call bioscience. Thank you for that. And if Dr. Chung, if you would like to add to that. I think they covered it all. There's nothing else left. Thank you all for that wonderful definition. Um, so our next question is, is there someone or something that inspired you to go into bioscience? Can we start with Dr. Chung and then go into Dr. Watkins and Dr. Meisel? 
I think one thing that I really started to understand as I was growing up and through my career is that you have plenty of people who influence you. So I can think of no less than, you know, two handfuls of mentors. But if I go back to my very first people who really encouraged me, that would be my parents. They always expected me to work really, really hard. And they always wanted me to have that choice. And then for research, I can think of Dr. Michael Bowen, who is at the University of the West Indies, and he is a diabetes researcher. And I didn't know it at the time, but the impression that he made on me was clearly long lasting. Oh, that's great, Dr. Chung. Uh, for me, it was sort of personal with the family. It wasn't just one person, but I do recall at an early age being in the hospital quite a bit because I had a sister and brother that had sickle cell anemia, and I was the only one of the three that did not have it. But there was a doctor's name. They'd always say Dr. Watkin without an S. And my mom would always say, you're going to be a doctor one day, uh, uh, unbeknownst to me. But ultimately, when I did get to college, there were two influential people. One was a, a Dr. Frank McCormick and a Dr. Arnold Levin. And they were scientists, but entrepreneurs. And it wasn't something you heard talked about a lot when you travel that road, that pure scientist talking about business or entrepreneurship. But I always wanted to be an entrepreneur and along the way, because my family experience developed an interest in science. And I'm doing that kind of work now that marries the two. So that's how I got my spark. Very nice. I guess my experience is also similar, kind of a combination of both of yours. Um, I also had a very supportive um, family, parents who pushed me and said, you know, do what you're interested in. And for me, that I kind of always was the sciences. Um, I was always outdoors when I was very young, um, you know, playing in the woods, uh, kind of stereotypically. I grew up in a village in Germany. Um, but really, when I got to college, I started working in a research lab right away. Um, and I am actually still in touch with that mentor. Uh, he really kind of got me interested in um, doing research and, and being in the academy and has just been wonderfully inspiring. Um, this is Dr. Jin Sung Kim, who's over at the University of Michigan. Um, and, and so it's been really, really formative having somebody who kind of is mentoring me through each career stage, even just giving advice on this is what you need to do in this stage. Um, so it's, it's been really, really inspiring to have somebody like that throughout kind of my entire process. Thank you all. OK, so next, you guys all obviously have very lengthy, very impressive positions. So I'm going to ask all of you guys to answer this question. Can you share with our students the type of work you do in your current position? And I'll throw it off to Dr. Chung first, and then Dr. Meisel and Dr. Watkins can answer. OK, so I wear many hats. Um, every week, I have a clinic at Children's National. Uh, and I take care of patients there who either have type 2 diabetes or who are at risk for type 2 diabetes. When I'm not at Children's, I'm at the NIH I'm in Bethesda, and I am taking care of patients there, usually young adults, so patients who have grown up and are in college, and they also have diabetes, and I'm running a research program, and that means that I'm bringing in kids and young adults, and we are trying to understand how different medications work. Two of the most common medications, metformin and liraglutide. They do a lot of teaching along the way, a lot of advocacy and outreach uh, to the DC, Virginia area, not this year because of the pandemic, um, but usually that's, that's what it is. I guess similar to Dr. Chung, I wear a lot of different hats. Um, in academia, we talk about three pillars, research, teaching, and service. Um, so the University of Maryland is a teaching and research intensive um, university. So I also run a research lab. Um, so that involves uh, mentoring and training PhD students, master's students, undergraduate students, occasionally high school students um, to actually do research in our kind of, we work in, in a field called immunoengineering. So trying to engineer um, different components of the immune system. And then I also teach, so I teach bioengineering courses for the undergraduates. Um, obviously, you know, that's something that potentially some of you guys might be interested in down the line. Um, 
but also we do service, which is, I think, the most unclear part of those pillars. Uh, so service means even doing things like this, for doing outreach, um, talking to students who might be interested in engineering. A lot, of, um, a lot of high school students don't really know what engineering is, especially bioengineering, because that's even really, really broad. Um, so we you know, do some outreach along those lines. We have work that we do within the university um, that's considered part of that um, pillar of, of kind of um, doing, doing our part for the university. Uh, so for instance, we recently started a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that I'm a part of, and we're trying to figure out how to make our uh, department a more inclusive environment. Um, so you wear lots of different hats as faculty. Obviously, I'm also a mentor um, for different students, both in my lab, in my class, and then we have mentees um, through the department um, for the undergraduate students as well. Um, so it's quite, quite, a, quite a lot of different things that you end up doing. Yeah, so so for me, the, this is a, a shout out to Dr. Mizell and Dr. Chung. Most most good companies readily recognize that, you know, ninety nine point nine percent of all great ideas come from outside of our own walls, our own companies. So, I spend a good bit of my time looking at innovation, looking at new opportunities, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I work with a very cross functional team. And what we do is we engage with people who are outside of our company. Many of them are folks like Dr. Mizell try and understand what is it that they're working on? How could that bring to bear something good for mankind when it comes to new solutions that make us a much better place to treat people who are, are sick, if you will, for lack of a better word. So that's what I really uh, enjoy. That's what I do. And so I get to do that with people who are physicians. Some are pure business persons, as you may or may not imagine. Some are pharmacists. So you have every discipline under the sun, which is one of the beautiful things about the industry, but it all works together. And so whether you work in academia, whether you work in a government organization or a company like Emergent, that whole ecosystem, as we like to call it, is what I get to interact in in my job because we know that good ideas are everywhere. They're abound. Wow. That is extremely impressive. Um, so I am going to ask a follow up. Uh, any one of um, any one of you guys can answer. Andrea asked, when you first entered the bioscience field, did it take time to get used to the work? And is the work harder than what you studied in college? I'll just say I couldn't believe they were paying me. <laughs> you know, when I first started working as a young guy, I would say, uh, the fact that I was getting to do what I wanted to do, but I got a paycheck for it, uh, it was exhilarating. And I, I worked as if I were still in college because it was almost like a kid in a, in a candy store, if you will, just because it was something that I would have done in my garage if I, if I had the ability to do that. And I think that's you know something we should all aim for, whatever you want to do, if it's in biosciences or something else for that matter. Make sure it's something you love, something you would do even if you weren't getting paid for it. I can go next. I, it's a lot of work to become a physician. It's a long time. And it most definitely was easily triple the amount of work I did in college. And then it just kind of continued to increase because as a, as a doctor, you have everybody's, you have that person's life in your hands. And the first oath we take is to not do any harm. And so you take that very seriously in terms of making sure that you know everything you can know. And so to, to be in the medical field, it's, it's such a noble profession, um, but you, you really want to understand that you, you have to work hard, you have to give your best because you're dealing with people. Yeah, I will say I had a very similar experience, I guess, um, where both I absolutely loved what I did. So I was gladly um, getting paid to actually do work in a research lab, um, both as a graduate student and later as a postdoc um, throughout my training. But it was a lot of very hard work um, and many hours spent in the research lab doing experiments. Um, it's certainly something where you need to have, um, I guess, a, a good amount of patience. <laughs> Uh, just because research is one of those uh, areas where you do experiments and a lot of the times they don't work the way that you want them to. Um, so, you know, in, in addition to, you know, being hard work, it's just, it, it takes a little bit of having kind of a long, long breath for being able to run the marathon rather than just sprint um, kind of a short distance. 
thank you all for your answers. I think it is so inspiring to hear that you all not only take it so seriously, but love what you're doing. And I think that is so important. Um, one of our students asked, Janani asked, what career paths can I pursue within bioscience? And I know we talked about it being very broad, so maybe this will help lessen that broadness. Um, we can start off with Dr. Chung, Dr. Meisel, and then Dr. Watkins. So a lot of times when the students come to me, they're like, I want to be a doctor. And I was like, are you sure? Or is that just what you saw on TV? Oh, okay, well, I'll be a nurse then. Um, but there's so many different fields in the healthcare as a healthcare team, and all of them are essential. I cannot do my job if I didn't have the team. And, and they can be very fulfilling. So just to give you some examples, we need patient care technicians, we need dietitians, social workers, physiotherapists, respiratory therapists, pharmacists we talked about, engineers we talked about, chemists, physicists, x-ray technicians, podiatry, uh, dental assistant, uh, optometry. So, and I don't think that's not by far uh, an exhaustive list. I don't know, Dr. Meisel, can you think of any other one? Yeah, there's plenty more to go around. So you can think about, you know, in industry, there is different kinds of jobs. And I'm sure Dr. Watkins, I'll leave that to you to speak more about. But in academia, you know, there is those of us who are running the research labs. There's the actual researchers doing the experiments. So I don't actually go into the lab very much anymore. I'm mostly responsible for, um, you know, publicizing our research and winning the grant money to actually fund the work that the students are doing. Um, so actually working physically in a research lab. Um, there are researchers that continue on just you know, running research labs only that don't do the teaching um, research and, and service that I do. Um, there's people running, um, for instance, the core facilities. So most, most university, most research institutions have core facilities that have key pieces of equipment that need to be maintained, where people need to be trained on the use. You know, you're learning about kind of the newest technologies to analyze research and analyze you know, samples, for instance. Um, so there's there's lots and lots of different types of um, jobs that even just in the academ academic world. Um, and I'll let Dr. Watkins speak to, to industry. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot to follow. So great, great advice thus far. And I, what, I, what I'd say is, you know, three buckets here. You can think about research and clinical development, R&D. You guys, you always hear about that. There is manufacturing that's also, also important. And then there's sales and marketing. But if you just think about what's happening today with the pandemic and our, our, our company is one that's really playing an important role in manufacturing vaccines. If you're an engineer, if you're someone who has a background in engineering, you may not ever know what an, a physician does or what a molecular biologist does in a laboratory. But guess what? That's a very important, critical and essential role in today's world when each and every day you're watching on television. When are we going to get more vaccine? How are they producing it? How's it going to get distributed? engineers and it's something that i learned and i always get exposed to new people this way is how important it is when you finally step into a place that manufactures vaccine that you can actually hold in your hand and you're an engineer speaking a completely different language all working in the same company you begin to develop an appreciation for there's no one piece of this that's more important than another and there are many different pathways although it may seem like we're all clinically medically scientifically oriented there's a whole lot of in between for people who do things very different from what we do but are a part of this bioscience industry and i'll just add on i think one path that we do tend to forget about is actually more in the government side so there's bioscience people working for the fda helping make the regulations um also in, in policy you know government needs people to inform them on how to decide things on bioscience related topics um so there's lots of opportunity there as well absolutely absolutely thank you guys so much for clarifying that for our students um another question we have here is what are the personal versus the more professional skills you need to work in this industry? We could start with Dr. Meisel, then go on to Dr. Chung, and, and with Dr. Walker. So there's obviously kind of um, having some sort of background knowledge in biosciences, whether that's a biology degree and bioengineering degree, chemistry, um, you know, having that background is, is really, really important, of course. Um, and then the skills really depend a little bit on what job you have in the end. Um, so for me, for instance, just to give an example, um, I obviously need to teach. 
So that's something that I have to learn how to do. Um, so teaching in, in my case is really important, not just in the classroom, but also in the research lab. So mentoring students, teaching them how to actually do research and become researchers. Um, so mentoring is definitely another skill that I, I think probably uh, most of us on, on the panel can tell you is really important in our jobs. Um, we do this on a daily basis. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll let the other panel speak to some other skills potentially that, that would be needed. Communication. So when I first thought I was going, you know, knew I wanted to be a doctor, I thought, okay, I have to learn all this science and integrate the physics and the chemistry. And I wasn't very good at language arts and I could write an essay, but it probably wasn't grammatically correct. And so what I had to re do is relearn how to communicate with people, spoken word, written word, presentation. Because no matter how much science I do, if I don't get that across to my patients, or to the leaders, public policy leaders, then it will all be for naught. I, I, I couldn't agree more with, with you, Dr. Chung and, and Dr. Mizell. And, and I, I live with, and my wife is a communicator, but we met because she also worked in the industry. And what I realized in, you know, in a very stark way was when I worked in a laboratory, I had a different set of skills and I was good at being at my bench and writing at my own little desk, but again, writing, operative word there, writing, and I was focused on me, myself, and I, when I moved outside the laboratory and I had to schedule meetings with multiple people, I needed to have what they call soft skills. And so I started to learn different ways of operating. You use technology, and I think all of you are probably accustomed to that. Just, just your generation is accustomed to it. So that's a, an attribute you'll take with you. But that ability to communicate and write effectively, yes, underscores all of the science that you think you will ever get into if that's your goal. But for the people who aren't scientists, realize, recognize that that communication skill and the interpersonal skills to influence, to communicate, to give people ideas and thoughts that can then be embraced to support what you're doing is highly critical in whatever you do. Thank you guys. That's great to get some non-science skills in there. Um, so this next question is directed towards Dr. Watkins. Throughout your career, you have worn many hats, one of them being a combat engineer for the US Army Reserve and national chairperson of the League of Combat of the League of Employees of African Descent. How have these services and leadership positions influenced your career and the person you are today? Well, that's a great, that's a great one. Uh, so my, my experience in the military, I, I just came from a long history of, of all of my uncles on my father's side are, are veterans. They all served, so I just felt that there was an obligation there. But, and I thought I was gonna learn some new habits, not quite so much, but I, but I did develop some new friends and I understood I understood what it meant to be a part of a team and what teamwork really meant. And that has carried through, through the, for the rest of my life. So the discipline you take with you from that carries into how you approach your job, how you approach your, your coworkers and your colleagues. The League of Employees of African Descent as a professional was a very good experience for me because the company that I worked at at that time had various affinity groups. Dr. Mizell mentioned her involvement in that where she is. But what it did was it exposed me to people from all different cultures, ethnicities, backgrounds, uh, physical capabilities. It was a way to really open my eyes and get new perspective. And I think that's the key thing is getting new perspective and seeing things from the standpoint of someone who is not like yourself to open you up to be able to work more effectively. But I think just enjoy life a bit more than someone who doesn't have that experience. Absolutely. Thank you for your answer. And more so, thank you for your service. Thank you again. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we are taking questions from our YouTube chat. So let's take a question from YouTube. If you could choose a different career, what would that be? We can start this <laughs> off with Dr. Watkins and then move on to Dr. Chung and Dr. Meisel. Well, it would be a, probably a politician. So my, my original goal when I left home was to get a degree in business, and then I was going to go to law school, start companies, be an entrepreneur, and be philanthropic, all to do good for people. So the, the social justice type of, of uh, angle uh, would, would have been me very much so, and I grew up in a home with a bureaucrat who worked in government. So it's a hobby for me that I pay attention to politics. I think I would be a baker. 
I really like to bake. <laughs> I really like to cook. And when I was younger, I always wanted to own a restaurant, but I don't have any entrepreneurial skills. I probably would have failed and ended up in healthcare anyway. Well, Dr. Chung, you stole my thunder there. <laughs> I feel like maybe this is a common common thing um, among scientists. We like to bake. I also love to bake. So that's well, there's my a lot of chemistry in plan. baking. Yeah, there's exactly. a lot of chemistry in baking. Exactly. I was just about to say that baking is kind of like being in a research lab. You know, you're adding things at certain ingredients where you're following a direction, you know, certain protocol. Um, you're paying attention to the amounts that you're putting into different things. It's chemistry, biology, engineering labs. We all do this on a, on a regular basis. So That's right. Molecular biology is like cooking, as we used to say. That's right. <laughs> You might have to all share some recipes with us at the end of this show. Um, but another question from YouTube, what advice would you give to students who aren't sure what they'd like to do as a career? We can turn this one to Dr. Chung, Dr. Meisel, and then Dr. Watkins. I think my advice would be to try to connect, talk with your counselor, um, explore opportunities, and try to get internships. And you don't have to know what you want to do right now. I, you know, I ran away from medicine and in, in my young, uh, in high school. I, I knew it was sort of a calling. And then I saw my dad and how hard he worked. And I said, I don't want to work that hard. And so I, I tried to explore other things to see if I would like that more. And then I came back to it. So internships, experiences as much as you can. Yeah, I'm going to second that. You don't really have to know what you're doing quite yet. Um, and actually, my ending up in engineering was a little bit fortuitous as well. Um, I was essentially told, well, if you may think that you like engineering, you should go into engineering. And if you don't like it, you can just leave. Um, so I did that and I ended up loving engineering. So sometimes taking a well-meant piece of advice um, is a good thing. But I also certainly didn't know that I wanted to be an engineer at the time. Yeah, I, I second all of that. I think just the more you can expose yourself to things that you can either like a whole lot or fail at, you learn a whole lot and continue to do what you're doing via this chat. Ask questions upon questions upon questions and don't be shy about it and take advantage of it in your youthfulness. Thank you guys all for that. Um, this next question is for Dr. Chung. Um, a student from YouTube is asking, I'm interested in studying medical biotechnology. What subjects should I study in high school to help me achieve my goals? That's a great question. And um, certainly the sciences, uh, but I really want you to make sure that you talk to your counselors in high school because they are the ones that are gonna have the programs there. They know what your history is and they know where you need to focus. You, do, you have to get certain sciences sort of as a foundation, but you don't have to do all sciences. And actually, I encourage you not to do all sciences. I went to a liberal arts college. I tried, I tried and failed at the economics. I tried and failed at many of the other things. So um, we talked about communication and language arts and just having that guidance and people there who will help you along, you can't go wrong. I may add to that as well, um, since biotechnology is often also bioengineering related. So for those of you who are at all considering bioengineering, definitely, as Dr. Chung said, talk to your counselors, um, figure out you know, what you need to focus on. Uh, but I know for engineering, math is definitely one of the things that universities look for, um, having sufficient background in math. Um, usually engineering schools then make you go through all of the calculuses. So um, that's, that's one of the things I, I can tell you at least about bioengineering. Yeah, I, I, so I'll frame it a little different way. What I say is really, I think Dr. Chung mentioned, be, be well-rounded, know what you like, and the sooner the better if you actually know. But that said, I didn't know when I was in, in, in high school that I wanted to go into the sciences, so it didn't hold me back. And I, you know, my advice is, again, work with people, reach out to people in your community. If you have friends, dads, moms who are involved in things that you think you wanna go into, Talk to them at the football game, the soccer game, the basketball game, and you will get as much information from them as you're getting from any of us on this call because they'll be happy to talk about what they do, believe me. Thank you, guys. So um, I'm going to not direct this question to anyone and don't feel like everybody needs to answer, but I'm sure you guys all have some experience. A student asked, what is it like to work 
in a laboratory setting? And can you talk more about the process of combining clinical and research work? I'll go first Dr. since uh, oh, go ahead. I run, go ahead, Dr. run a research lab. <laughs> Um, so working in a research lab, it depends a little bit on what kind of lab. Um, so we talk usually in the research world about dry labs and wet labs. Um, so wet lab is what I run. So there you're actually going into a lab, you're putting on gloves, protective wear, um, pipetting things, working with cells, um, working with different instruments. Um, usually there's you know mentoring, you'll be working with somebody more senior who's teaching you techniques until you're comfortable to then do the techniques on your own. Um, for the dry labs, those would be more on the computational side of things. So that's also part of kind of the bioengineering and biosciences world where you're more on the side of analysis and trying to build also mathematical models, for instance, of biological systems. Um, so that's a little bit about kind of different kinds of labs and, and different kinds of work that you can do there. Uh, just to add on to that, because I have experience in the wet lab and the dry lab, and then the third experience would be to interact with the patients at NIH. Um, our mission is, is innovation and everything medical research and to really alleviate disease. And the way to design the campus at NIH is to have that continuity and communication between the wet lab, the, the dry lab, as well as the patients. Um, and so seeing the patients and then taking some of those questions to the bench and then back again to the bedside. And my experience was all in the laboratory. So I think uh, Dr. Chung and Mazel answered that very well. Thank you guys. Um, I have a follow-up question. What are the different factors that go into conducting research? Again, for I anybody. Think, I think probably the most important factor is having a research question. So trying what are you trying to answer? What are you trying to research? Um, and why is that important? I think those are the two, two key things um, for even starting to go about doing any sort of research. Um, so, so kind of trying to establish those, um, you know, the research is big. There's lots of topics in biosciences that you could possibly look into. So it's a matter of identifying and narrowing that down sufficiently so you can actually go and design an experiment that will answer a question, you know, kind of maybe biting away a small piece at a larger question that you're trying to answer. Yeah, Marcelo, the way, the way, so how I approach becoming a scientist, one, when I was in college, I thought it was important to get a theoretical grounding, really understand how to think how to think about the scientific method. And that's important. And there's a lot of precedent for how people have thought about science. And you can look at areas where people have been successful. And oftentimes you'll find a lot of successful people in science seem to come out of certain little pockets. And so you, you develop a genuine curiosity there. How are they thinking? What are they doing so as not to reinvent the wheel? But once you begin to work in more of a wet lab scenario, I wanted to become a good molecular biologist. I wanted to become a good cell biologist. I wanted to be a good biochemist. And then I wanted to be able to work with animals and organisms because at the end of the day, we're gonna break everything down, whether we're a human, an animal, a dog, or a cat, we're gonna break it down to DNA, RNA, proteins, cells, and then that big organism that's made up of all these different systems that we either work on as physicians or try to study when we're in the laboratory. So I agree. We talked about in the importance of asking a question of, of asking the important question um, and then researching. And then the, the last thing is having the courage to conduct the study, but put your results out there. So peer review and being able to be open to criticism of your work is that finishing piece because everything will not be for anything unless you get it out there and you have the, the peers who say, yes, Dr. Meisel, that's really, really important. We agree with you. We disagree with this part, but overall your work is wonderful. And I think that's the ultimate test of what we do. So you, you want a doctor like Dr. Chung when you go to the doctor, Marcel. <laughs> Thank you all for that. Um, Here's a question that many of us are curious about. What are some real world impacts of your research or work? 
Um, for example, in the healthcare industry, the food industry, um, this should be an easy question, actually. Uh, we could start with Dr. Watkins, go on to Dr. Marzel, and then finish Dr. Chung. Yeah, well, yeah, right. No, so no, I've I've been fortunate. I think I've been near things that excite me, whether or not I worked on them myself personally or not. Um, and more recently, again, being a part of the company that I'm with now, uh, working on and understanding that the opioid crisis prior to the pandemic and even during the pandemic uh, has impacted a lot of families. And being able to be up close and personal with a, a team of people, you know, who work on public health threats. Right, uh, things that are difficult to work on, to really be able to bring that to more of the public in a way that more people can get their hands on it and that it's effective. So the Narcan uh, you mentioned in the early read of my bio, being able to be a part of that was was phenomenal. Working as an oncolo in oncology and working on on things that led to uh, drugs that are on the market that are in use now for immuno oncology have been phenomenal experiences. Uh, so I you know I'd say it's been it go it ebbs and flows. Uh, and you may or may not ever be a part of a drug that's on the market that you've actually directly contributed to, but collectively, the people you're around and the excitement, um, you know, is one of a kind. Yeah, so that's definitely very exciting being on, at the forefront and developing those drugs. Um, I was fortunate enough as a graduate student um, to be part of some work um, for HIV prevention that actually since has been translated into phase one clinical trials and they're trying to start up phase two and three trials. So that's actually very much unheard of in the bioengineering world to get your research from the bench starting to even be translated over to where maybe you know, somebody like Dr. Chung could apply it to a patient. Um, so, so that was for me probably one of the highlights um, of, of my graduate career. Um, but on the other side, um, one of the really big impacts that we at the university have is actually on, on the students. Um, so we're the ones helping to shape and train the next generation, which I think is, is a huge impact that we're having on society there. Yeah, the, the NIH is an awesome place. I can't claim plenty of those translation from the bench to the bedside. I, do everything I can as you know the director of the metabolic research unit to try to encourage that and to give my little small piece. I think personally for my research, I'm most proud of being able to take care of my patients, listen to their problems and their questions, take some of those questions and actually put, change them into research and design studies around that. And so we're just now being able to use that information so that I can give my patients back those answers. Thank you guys so much for that. Um, so next I'm going to ask, um, anybody can jump into this question. Uh, can you share a breakthrough moment in your research or work with your companies? And what was that like? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was in the laboratory working with mice, working with mice, uh, the way the way that we do uh, with oncology oftentimes are you use mice in your studies and they have tumors. And you're every day looking for whatever it is that you're working on, whatever drug you're trying to test, you are hoping like all you know what, that it actually shrinks or it stops it from growing. And the first time that I ever was able to see a drug effectively shrink a tumor, and again, a mouse is not a human, okay? <laughs> so not, it's not often that these things translate into actual drugs that are on the market. But for me, that was, that was worth all the years of, you know, painstaking work and developing tests and assays and working with chemists in the laboratory to make molecules so that we could see whether or not there was anything that was possible. That was probably the most exhilarating thing for me as a scientist, just to see that firsthand. I guess I, I shared one of mine already, um, but similar to uh, Dr. Watkins, I also, in my research lab, actually one of the projects that we started out with, you know, we're very young, um, but we've actually had some data showing that um, we can help um, enhance also, again, in mice, not in patients, 
um, treat a rare lung disease that we work with using some actually cancer immunotherapies that are already on the market, that are already drugs that are existing, kind of repurposing them for rare diseases. So I think that's that's something that for me has been incredibly rewarding. It, it is rewarding to be able to treat patients and to, to have them come out and to feel better. Um, but I'd like to share another aspect of what we do, which we've been talking about a lot, which is mentoring and teaching. And I can tell you that the joy that I get when my trainees are successful is, is nothing like I've experienced before. They, you know, they're, they're part of you and you have so much investment and you work so closely with your trainees that their success really reflects on us. And it just, it just makes me happy. Thank you all for your answers. I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Watkins. You previously mentioned vaccines and the work your company is doing. How has COVID-19 changed your work? Uh, COVID-19 is just the way we work. It's really had an impact because I've, I've been working remotely since last March. So all of the people who are getting the work done so that companies like ours and others uh, are having to deal with very difficult circumstances just to communicate right? And to get the work done. And for the people who are going directly to manufacturing facilities, they bear the same risk that anyone else bears that have to go out in the public and, and do what they do. But in this case, be able to manufacture the actual vaccines that, that in some cases we're all will end up taking. So I think that's been a significant change. How we think about our world now will be forever different. Uh, how we think about technologies will be forever different. You guys have heard about mRNA vaccines. If you want to speak about specific technologies, uh, there are a variety of vaccines over the years and vaccine types and platforms that you hear a lot of people on television pontificating and debating and discussing which one is or isn't important. But in general, I think it's brought a lot of very good attention to what we do. And for someone who's grown up in the industry, there are those times where you hear things that aren't so positive about our industry and you hear about people who don't completely appreciate it and they think it's driven by things that aren't necessarily of all goodwill but it's times like this the people that are making the sacrifice like the ones i just described i think it's really shed light that hey there's far more good uh, then there is a downside to it. And, and, you know, I would take offense to that, but I'm very proud of the industry that I'm in now. And so the changes of the pandemic, I think, has shined light on what the good is. Thank you guys all for that. Um, you guys have answered so many of our questions. We're just going to dive right into a speed round before we wrap up. The first question is, um, Work-life balance is so important. What activities or hobbies do you do to relax? And just a reminder, we want to keep these really short so we can get in as many um, quick little questions as possible. So we can start with Dr. Chung, with Dr. Watkins, and then end with Dr. Devine. I like to cook, bake, and run. I started cycling this year, and I did my first 100-mile bike ride. I also started cycling this year, and I also bake and play piano. Beautiful. We have bakers and we have doctors. Um, the next question is, is there a talent, hobby, or skill that is non-science related that you would say has helped advance your research or career? Boy, that's a good um, one. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> one. I think everything my parents did helped enhance me and who I am and therefore my research career. They made me do, I had to do basketball and I was terrible at it and I did not like any moment of it, but I am sure that it helped. <laughs> Dr. Mizell? I was just going to say the, the hobby that we've all been talking about, baking. Um, baking and cooking has definitely helped me kind of think through how do I do research? How do I go through a protocol and kind of give me a foundation, if you will, for that? Yeah, you mentioned LEAD earlier. Being involved in sort of a volunteer organization exposed me to a lot of people that helped me in more ways than one to move from research to more of a business-oriented career. Never would have envisioned it. Great. That is amazing. I love these answers. Um, tell me something about yourself that people would be surprised to know. 
we can start this off with Dr. Meisel, then Dr. Chung, then Dr. Watkins. Um, people are often surprised to know that I'm a non-native English speaker. English is quite good. Thank you. People get surprised when I tell them I have three children. I don't know why. I have identical twin boys that are considered mirror image and one's left-handed and one's right-handed. But I have three sons too. <laughs> wow, that's very cool. Um, next question. If there was a person in history you could meet, who would it be and why? Feel free to jump in. We'll start with Dr. Watkins. Uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, his grit, his excellence. He was friends with many leaders of the day who I looked up to and admired, and he would be the one. These are so much fun. Okay. <laughs> How have you used social media and online platforms in your work? Um, I can jump in on that one. So I have a Twitter account that's uh, Science Twitter. Uh, so it's where I promote my research, where I also try to read about other scientists' research. Um, we obviously we have a, a website as well for my research lab. Um, so those are kind of the two two platforms that I deal with. And NIH has a Twitter account and NIDDK. You know, we sort of try to reach many different people through through those mediums. Um, we also, you know, try to connect with our youth and young adults. Um, through different advocacy, advocacy through social media. And we're using these platforms to also get people interested in the type of research that we're doing and to say, hey, these are these kinds of studies. Um, would you like to be invited to volunteer? I'm, I'm able to remain connected with people I've met along the way over the years. Uh, your memory fades, but with social media, you get a constant reminder of who they are. And oftentimes they're very helpful in what you do. And it allows other people who are interested in our company from a business standpoint to also present to us at all times, anything that might be of interest. So it's very useful. Great, I love this. Communication is a huge um, overall topic between all of these social media questions. But um, going back to our student questions, Lily asked, how many years of college slash post-secondary school does it take to work in bioscience? And we can turn this off to anyone who would like to. Um, keep in mind, we have about 10 minutes left, so just keep them a little short. Stephanie, you, you might have had the longest road. <laughs> <laughs> but it depends on what you're doing. So like we said, there's so many different opportunities, so don't let that deter you. You can do and be a patient care assistant or a dental assistant graduating from high school and doing a few months certificate course. Um, if you want to do other things, you know, nursing two to four years. Um, I went to school for eight years, 12. Actually, when you add up everything, it's about 12 years. Um, so it just depends on what you want to do. Thank you. Uh, oh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. Next question. I was looking at Dr. Mizell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this question is um, very like a wholesome question. What is the most rewarding thing about your career? Um, you can start with Dr. Mizell. Uh, I think the most rewarding thing is working with students. Um, I think that's been throughout, you know, I've, I've trained, even when I was a graduate student, I was already training undergraduates in the lab as well. Um, and kind of, I guess, to what Dr. Chung had said earlier, is seeing those students um, excel and, and succeed in what they want to do, that's probably the most rewarding thing about my job. I love seeing my patients grow up and lead healthy lives and turn into like the most confident and awesome people. Uh, you may have seen a commercial a while ago where it says it's not rocket science and it's done by pharma, one of the trade associations in our industry. But then they show scientists and healthcare professionals pulling off a feat of making a new drug and getting it to patients. And I like the complexity of being able to be a part of that. Perfect. Thank you so much for your answers. Um, so Summer asked, what changes would you like to see take place in your field, whether that be within the structure or culture of it? Uh, you know, I'll go. So on that on that note, uh, what I would like to see is this industry, which is a STEM industry, really be the engine for economic development. And one, I think that can really address some of the issues that America's confronted with today, 
and so I think we have the ability to play a role in underserved communities and be a leader in that way. One of the major missions of the NIH is to train the next generation of sciences and to ensure that the workforce is inclusive and diverse. And I think we've done a lot within NIH, intramural and extramural and around the country, but there is so much more to do. And so I would like to see that diverse workforce. I think Dr. Watkins and Dr. Chung have said it all. All right, then, thank you guys so much. So we're nearing the end of our time together. So I'm gonna ask you guys these final questions. What advice do you have for students wanting to pursue a career in bioscience? Any final advice? Don't be afraid to ask questions and find people who can actually answer your questions for you. Um, people in our industry are not afraid to talk to students and I get emails all the time asking for advice. Um, so that's, you know, that's very, very normal for us. I would say work hard and be stubborn. Be persistent. Somebody tells you no, just say, okay, thank you, and keep going. You might have to adjust a little bit. It's okay, there's no straight path to biomedical sciences. All of us have had a windy path, but you have to have fun and you have to be persistent and you have to really want it. Yeah, I would, I would say be careful what you let go into your ears because people will talk about things in terms of what's hard and what's not hard. I always looked at things as, well, this may take more time to learn and digest and understand, and other things may take less time. So be very careful the crowd you keep and what you allow to go in and out of your ears or out of your mouth and into your ears and use that to drive your passion, get exposure. Okay, one final question. Is there any questions that you wish we had asked today that we didn't? Really good set of questions here. I wanted to, I wanted to say something about the opportunities that are available to anyone who is interested. We have at NIH a very robust summer student program. And I know that the other universities around the country, uh, around this area, I'm speaking directly to us in Montgomery, uh, also have those. But the high step program at the NIH is a summer program, and it's specifically for Maryland, Virginia, DC, you know, this 40 mile radius. And you'll get the exposure in this time and almost everyone, I can't speak for everybody, but there's lots of mentors at NIH who are just willing and excited to, to teach and mentor and share. Thank you all. Oh, sorry. Continue, Dr. No, just, just, just no, I just uh, hats off to you all. Thanks for inviting us. And I think the set of questions were, were really great and they probed a lot of different areas, challenged us. Yeah, they were very great. Thank you for having us all. Thank you all for your time today and for your knowledge. Um, and thank you to all the students who submitted questions. I've learned so much from this conversation and appreciate your stories, advice, and dedication to bioscience. For students interested in learning about MCPS career readiness programs, please visit the website on the screen. MCPS offers a number of programs that provide students real world learning experiences, college credit and industry certifications. And thanks to all the students who tuned in today. Let's show on the screen now the QR code and a bit.ly address. Both the QR code and link will take you to a survey where you can provide us feedback about today's show and future programs. The bit.ly address is bit.ly slash let's talk career survey. Please take the time to share thoughts and ideas with us. Thank you. And check our website, www.mcpsletstalkcareers.org to watch past episodes and learn about career readiness programs that MCPS offers to students. Coming up on Wednesday, February 3rd at 10 a.m., the next Let's Talk Career session will focus on arts and entertainments and feature Louis Black, an actor and comedian, Brian King Joseph, a violinist, and Tatiana Wexler, a singer and songwriter. That is going to be an amazing discussion. That's all for today. This is Marcella from Northwest. And Taylor from Wheaton and Thomas Edison. And Ashley from Gaithersburg signing off. Bye. Bye. Bye.